Hi, my name is Maciek Pytel, and I'm a software engineer at Google. I've been working on Cluster Autoscaler as uh, part of the GKE team and as a member of open source community for slightly more than six years now. And uh, at GKE, I, I've been part of the team that is running uh, Cluster Autoscaler in, in thousands and thousands of clusters of our customers, ranging from very small ones all the way to 15,000 node clusters. And I wanted to share some of our experiences with you today. So in this talk, I am going to focus on um, reliability aspect of running Cluster Autoscaler. Um, I'm going to talk about metrics, logs, and other um, tools that I think are useful here. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much on cost optimization, and I'm also not going to deep dive uh, into how Cluster Autoscaler works internally. I have done some deep uh, dives in the past, and uh, I recommend my recordings from past KubeCons that they are on YouTube. Um, so today I'm going to have three parts. I'm going to start with a quick summary of how Cluster Autoscaler works, and I'm going to only focus on the parts that I think, uh, that I think are relevant um, from the perspective of uh, understanding what can go wrong and maintaining it. Then I'm going to quickly discuss some of the tools, tools like metrics uh, or logs that I think are the most useful from perspective of monitoring and debugging Cluster Autoscaler. And finally, I'm going to try to illustrate some uh, common issues and how, the, how those tools could be used to diagnose them. Um, so let's start. And uh, I want to start with a sort of quick uh, let's say mission statement. Um, right, so the problem I'm going to focus on in here is, is the problem of making sure that all the pods can schedule. I think this is really the primary job of Cluster Autoscaler, right? If you don't have enough nodes in your cluster and your pods cannot schedule when you want to run a batch job or, or its traffic spike hits, uh, then Cluster Autoscaler just isn't doing its job and there is a problem that needs to be fixed. And we're going to try to detect that problem and prevent it. And so, um, some key facts about how Cluster Autoscaler is achieving this. Um, first of all, Cluster Autoscaler is actually reacting to pending pods. So this is, this is what triggers the autoscaling. And it, when, whenever it sees those pending pods, it's going to calculate how many VMs are needed to run those pods. And it's going to go to cloud provider and request that those VMs are created. However, it's not really involved in um, starting those VMs in any way other than just uh, triggering it. It's not initializing the VMs. It's not setting labels or things on, on them. And it's also not responsible for creating or deleting Kubernetes node objects that's, that's done by node controller. And uh, I think that that was just a summary of, of what Cluster Autoscaler does, but I also wanted to touch on one of the aspects of how it does it. Um, so on one side, we have Kubernetes, right, which is this nice uniform set of APIs that look the same on every cloud. But on the other side, the Cluster Autoscaler is sort of sitting behind those nice APIs and the cloud provider side APIs, which are not standardized. They are not really consistent or even very similar between some Clouds. Uh, Cluster Autoscaler is often behind the scenes using conceptually similar uh, cloud provider concepts of, of, no, of groups of nodes like uh, AWS, ASGs, or GC managed instance groups, Azure, VMSS, and so on. There are, there are equivalents of those on many clouds. However, there are significant differences in API. And there isn't really a requirement that cloud provider integration cluster autoscaler is backed by a mechanism like this. So while the core logic of cluster autoscaler and the Kubernetes APIs it talks to is going to be consistent in every installation, uh, the cloud provider APIs and the cloud provider module in, in cluster autoscaler uh, that integrates with them is going to be different. And Actually, the cloud provider is, is a very significant part of autoscaler logic. And uh, unfortunately, that means that in practice, a lot of issues are going to look at least slightly differently in different clouds. Uh, many metrics may look slightly differently. 
I'm going to try to underline this. And there may be some issues that are specific to certain clouds that just won't show up in other clouds. Um, and also, there are some issues that are actually quite common uh, across many clouds. Uh, but they may look slightly differently. So one example I have here is um, API QPS quota exhaustion. This is a very common problem for cluster autoscaler. And, and uh, the challenge with it is uh, that those, those quotas look differently. And based on how much caching a given cloud provider integration is doing in cluster autoscaler, it's, it's going to be a different size of the cluster, a different number of node groups that really triggers those, is, those issues. Um, I don't think there is uh, one good way to monitor it inside of cluster autoscaler. However, it is something I would recommend uh, you monitor on your cloud provider side as much as possible. Um, another aspect that I think is, is often quite different between different clouds is uh, non-functional non sort of behaviors of cluster autoscaler things like scalability or scale-up latency. It, it's going to take different amount of time to boot a VM in different environments. And uh, especially scalability is, is so heavily dependent on caching uh, and optimization that is done on cluster autoscaler cloud provider level uh, that it's, it's going to differ potentially significantly between clouds. Officially, Cluster Autoscaler Core supports uh, 1,000 nodes. That's what we say in open source repository. In practice, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident it's much more. We've been running uh, much larger clusters in GKE uh, without uh, any significant optimizations to the core logic of Autoscaler. Um, right, and one more aspect I wanted to uh, touch on uh, is, is how to run Cluster Autoscaler, right? So Cluster Autoscaler is using a leader election mechanism. So you can run multiple replicas in the single cluster. One of them is going to be active and the others are going to serve as backup. I obviously recommend uh, doing this if possible. And um, cluster autoscaler is mostly stateless. Uh, it can be restarted safely. However, there is some uh, loss of scale down status, which essentially means any restart is going to delay scale down potentially by a few minutes. And also, it, it requires regenerating all caches, so it's, it's kind of expensive in terms of startup time. Um, so occasionally, restart is fine. Uh, however, restarting it too much is going to be a problem. And two scenarios that I would watch for in particular is cluster autoscaler trying to scale down a node it is running on. Uh, what's going to happen is it's going to drain itself. It's going to restart itself uh, before it actually removes the VM. And uh, when it restarts, it's just going to ab abandon the scale down attempt. So it's just going to restart itself, but it's not actually going to delete the VM. And uh, I think the worst sort of case failure mode is if cluster autoscaler pod is pending and it cannot be scheduled, then there is no way for the system to recover from this scenario because there is just nothing that would add the node that would allow it to schedule. And so for these reasons, I would recommend, if, if again, if possible, running cluster autoscaler on some dedicated nodes. Um, an alternative is to prevent uh, cluster autoscaler from being scaled down by using either PDBs or uh, safe to evict false annotations of cluster autoscaler. This will prevent the scale down. However, it's not 100% bulletproof. There are other mechanisms that can restart it. I think pod preemption is, is one example here where a system uh, workload is always going to have higher priority and can preempt the autoscaler. And finally, um, the solution that we're using in GKE and that, that I would recommend in um, any self-managed environment where you have access to control plane is to just ra run cluster autoscaler on the control plane VMs. Um, it's really part of the scheduling uh, and so it makes sense conceptually, I think, to run it next to scheduler. And it's just going to completely um, remove all those issues of, of restarts that I mentioned. Finally, I think this, this part isn't really very surprising, but I would recommend testing your configuration uh, before using it in production. And two particular aspects I wanted to highlight here are cluster autoscaler flags. Um, 
some flags are very commonly changed by many users and are, I think, very safe to change. Things like utilization thresholds or scale down timers are, are very commonly tweaked and there isn't much that can go wrong. However, some flags aren't really used that often and have some significant side effects. I am going to particularly mention ignore taint flag uh, here. I could probably spend half an hour talking uh, about exactly how it changes internal behavior of cluster autoscaler. And uh, I've seen so many issues caused by this flag. So I'm just going to um, warn you against this. And if you, if, you, if you want to use it, I would suggest uh, testing it in some sort of staging environment. And of course, things work differently at scale, uh, right? So especially with things like Autoscaler, the adding one node and adding a thousand nodes may take a very different amount of time. And uh, it's always worth testing. All right, so with this, let me move on to the tools that I think are useful for um, running and monitoring cluster Autoscaler. And the first are going to be metrics. And I think, uh, if, if there is one thing I'd, I'd like you to remember from this presentation, it's really going to be this slide. Um, as I said already, the uh, job of Cluster Autoscaler is to make sure that all the pods are schedulable. And so I think the best way to monitor that it's achieving this job is, is to monitor the number of pending pods. If there are any pods that are pending for a really long time, that just means that the job of Cluster Autoscaler is not being done. It doesn't necessarily mean the problem is in Autoscaler itself. However, it means it's not really uh, achieving its task. And I think Autoscaler is a good place to start uh, debugging such issues. Um, there is, I think, a very convenient metric for this. Uh, Kubernetes Scheduler has a pending pod metrics that I think is ideal here. Um, actually, Cluster Autoscaler has its own metric, but that, that essentially gives you the same number. But I just prefer using a metric done by other, uh, or provided by other component, because then if there is a problem with Autoscaler, you will still have a metric coming from um, Scheduler. And so I think if, if you just want a single alert for Cluster Autoscaler, I think that's the best one. I would also recommend uh, maybe alerting on the fact that Cluster Autoscaler is running. I don't necessarily have a slide for this, because I think exactly how you monitor this depends heavily on, on, on how you run it. If you run it on control plane or on your nodes, you may want to use a different metric, but that's, that's also something useful. And uh, there are many more cluster autoscaler metrics. However, I'm just going to focus on, I think, four maybe other metrics, and I'm just going to use three graphs as, as I go through different issues that I think are most useful for debugging. And so in addition to pending pods, what I, what I think is a super useful graph for any sort of debugging is a graph that just shows you nodes in the cluster by different state. There is a cluster autoscaler metric for that. And uh, on the same graph, just have a rate of scale up and scale down uh, done by cluster autoscaler. I'm going to show this graph in a second and hopefully I will be able to convince you that it is a, a really great, very useful graph. And I think it's also useful looking for different metrics that uh, report the error rates of cluster autoscaler. Uh, I think failed scale ups total is in particularly a, a particularly useful one. If, if your scale ups are failing, there is likely an issue that may require attention. Um, the errors total metric is also there, uh, but it's it's more noisy because it's going to capture sort of random 500 one of transient errors that you get from cloud provider. And so I found this one to be much more noisy and as such sort of less useful, but it's definitely also something uh, worth looking at if there is an issue. And so I mentioned the graph that uh, shows both the nodes and cluster autoscaler activity, and that's this graph here. And um, I uh, just want to go through how a typical scale up looks like. This is basically what you'd expect if, if your scale up goes perf perfectly well. So on the bottom graph, I have the number of pending pods. I have uh, been splitting these per different queues in scheduler. I don't think that's really strictly necessary. It's useful sometimes for catching even issues in cluster autoscaler or scheduler itself. It's, it's possible that the sort of nodes are there, but the pods get stuck in scheduler. Uh, but I'm not really going to focus on this. So if you just aggregate all of those queues together, that's also fine. Um, so what we see here is basically the number of pending pods go up. And in response, we can see the scale up rate in cluster autoscaler to also go up. That's the bold line on the top graph. 
Um, and as, as the scale up happens, we can see more nodes, like the number of nodes in, is increasing. And initially those new nodes are, are on this graph, they are red. So that means that they are unregistered. So those are VMs that are already there on cloud provider side. However, they don't yet have a corresponding node object in Kubernetes. So the VM is maybe spinning up, the operating system is starting up, the kubelet uh, is initializing and so on. It all takes time. But we see the VMs are already there. And then there is this small yellow window where the VMs are not started. That means that the node object is already there. However, uh, the, 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 it's, it's not yet ready. So the status condition shows that the node isn't ready yet. And this is basically how every scale up is going to look like. You're going to first see those unregistered nodes, then you're going to see not started nodes, and finally, uh, you're going to have ready nodes that are just going to be able to run your pods. And I'm going to show how distinguishing those different stages of, of node life cycle uh, is going to be helpful uh, later on when I get to some issues. Um, I'm also going to quickly cover how a scale down would look like on the same graph. I don't have pending pods this time because uh, if, if cluster autoscaler is scaling down, that, that probably means that there, are, there aren't any. Uh, but we can see here the rate of scale down going up again. Uh, and uh, that's the bold line, and then the number of nodes is decreasing. So that's, that's pretty obvious, but one thing that's very useful, and uh, I think that's commonly used by me to, or seen by me in many issues, is that uh, um, the lack of the scale down activity by cluster autoscaler can be very telling here. So sometimes um, there, there are other ways that the number of nodes can change. Right? Someone may, may resize their uh, node group manually, or maybe there is some sort of upgrade mechanism that can delete nodes. There can be other things than cluster autoscale that can delete nodes. And just looking at this graph would tell you immediately that the number of nodes have decreased without autoscaler intervention if there is a fall in the number of nodes, but there is no scale down rate increasing. So this is why I find this uh, useful uh, to just uh, sort of filter out issues that aren't really as related to autoscaler. I, now, the, another thing I wanted to mention is Kubernetes events. So cluster autoscaler write Kubernetes events on pods, nodes, and uh, cluster autoscaler status config map in Kube system. Uh, the config map basically will give you like an event log of all the actions taken by, by autoscaler, and the pod events can tell you why uh, cluster autoscaler is not scaling up if a certain pod, even if certain pod is pending, or it can show you that cluster autoscaler in fact has triggered a scale up specifically because this pod was pending. I think it's quite useful for debugging, especially those uh, problems where cluster autoscaler is not scaling up when you think it should be. And uh, it's definitely much easier and faster than going to, to the logs. And uh, yeah, the, the logs are sort of, uh, to me, the last result. If, if nothing else has helped, if there is no events, if there is no metrics, then I would go to logs. Uh, I think they are very verbose and sometimes hard to understand, so I, I wouldn't recommend starting there. And uh, if you have to read the logs, right, there are, I think, two main um, suggestions I would have. So firstly, cluster autoscaler runs in loops, and each loop is essentially in independent. Uh, so cluster autoscaler will reconcile state of the cluster. It will look for any pending pods. It will see if they would maybe be able to schedule on the nodes that are already booting up. And if not, it's going to trigger a scale up. And it's just going to run those loops over and over and over. So if you're debugging an issue, I would just focus on a single loop. I have, I have the log lines on the slide for, for grapping, but I would just focus on a single loop and just try to debug it there because it's just going to repeat over and over. There isn't that much point reading it. Uh, however, not all the loops are created equal. And then the, in some loop, the scale up will happen, right? The first time autoscaler notices a pending pod, it will trigger a scale up. And then for a number of following loops, what's going to happen is it will see that there are nodes already spinning up and it will just do nothing waiting for those. So you always want to debug uh, the loop where the actual decision was made. And so the, fir the very first thing I do whenever I look at logs, like, in 99% of times is I'm going to look for this final scale-up plan log. There are the logs associated with scale-up. That's just the one I like using. Uh, it's going to be there whenever there is a scale-up, so I think it's quite useful. So 
with this, let me qu quickly move on to showing um, how I would use those metrics and, uh, and events to debug some common issues. And the first one I have is any sort of cloud provider error, right? So what we see here is basically cluster autoscaler notices, pending pods. We see there is a number of pending pods, and so an alert on this would detect the problem. And it, it, it's trying to scale up, and uh, it's basically nothing is happening. It's just repeatedly trying and failing. And uh, if we look at the failed scale-up uh, graph, we see those scale-ups are indeed failing, and there is a reason there, right? So that, that just makes it pretty obvious what the problem is, right? In this case, I just ran out of quota for, uh, I think, CPUs in my project. I, I can't see what the quota is, but I already know it's a quota exhaustion issue, so I can just go to logs now and uh, probably find that quite easily. Um, and the thing with this is, uh, actually, the, another thing I wanted to quickly show up is how Cluster Autoscaler retries the scale-up periodically. However, those periods are increasing, right? So this is because Cluster Autoscaler uses an exponential back-off mechanism. So it will start by retrying very often, but it will, over time, uh, retry less and less until it hits the maximum uh, back-off duration of half hour. And so this is, this is, this is kind of uh, common in issues. Um, right, and uh, yeah, everything in, like th that graph would look the same for any other sort of uh, cloud provider side issue, right? So it may be that the cloud provider is out of stock and there is no quota issue. And it would look the same, it's just that the label on the metric would be different. Or that, that, that there may be some sort of IP space exhaustion issue, for example. There is any number of things that can go wrong on cloud provider side. Um, one thing uh, is that the labels on the failed scale-up metric depend on the particular cloud provider implementation uh, giving us structured information about what the error is, and that often ends up, I think, just with regex on error messages that are specific to a given cloud provider, so the level of detail you get may uh, be different uh, depending on what error a given provider recognizes. Right, another issue that is, I think, like, literally the most common type of issue is that the nodes are failing to start. So this is different. We're not getting an error when we make an API call to cloud provider. The VMs are actually getting uh, created, and you can see this in the graph here, right? Cluster Autoscale is trying to scale up, and then we see those red uh, unregistered nodes. So the VMs are there. They are getting created. It's just that they are unable to join Kubernetes cluster. And we see, in this case, the... Uh, scale-ups are failing because of 15-minute timeout. So basically, Cluster Autoscaler will, will give a VM 15 minutes to register, and it, if it fails to do so, it assumes there is some sort of a problem, and it's, uh, it's going to delete that VM and, and retry later on. Uh, this usually happens because of networking issues, but there can be any number of reasons. I produced this particular graph by just creating a firewall rule that uh, prevented uh, kubelet from reaching API server. This is a very common issue, but there can be any number of other issues. Image pooling problems are often uh, are also quite common, and, and really anything can go wrong on the node side. Um, right, uh, another, another one I wanted to quickly show up was uh, no option to scale up, right? So this is what I also mentioned earlier when talking about events. Cluster Autoscaler may not even try to scale up because it doesn't think the pod will be able to schedule on any of the nodes that it can create. Um, I think the most simple case or the most simple reason for this is if your pod has a node selector, but there is no node group that has the matching label, right? Then Cluster Autoscaler will not scale up because uh, there is no point, essentially, at least as far as Autoscaler is concerned. And then it will write an event on the pod. So if you just kubectl describe the pod, there will be a not trigger scale up event. It's going to have a message. Um, one thing about reading those messages, it says, I think, one node uh, didn't match node selector. Like in this case, in because we're reusing re scheduler error messages, but uh, this, this really should be read as one node group. Uh, was not scaled up because like nodes in that node group would not match the node selector. So I only had one node group there and, and it didn't have the node selector I needed. And uh, yeah, I think that, that's what I wanted to discuss. Um, 
I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you.